I'm Jenny Batts and I'm going to be talking about a labouring class poet called Mary Leeper. But in this talk I'm going to focus on a, on a writer who is, to my mind, one of the most exciting writers of the 18th century. Mary Leeper was a kitchen maid who wrote accomplished verses and who won accolades from literary society. She's a vibrant and lively poet who offers a unique and often very funny uh, perspective on mid-18th century society. Despite her social position, her lowly social position, she's seldom deferential and never obsequious. When she's writing about any of her patrons, she's more likely to tease and mock them than she is to prostrate herself in gratitude before them. She's ambitious, but she refuses to take herself or her poetry too seriously. She's an exciting talent, a writer who, when she found time to spare in her busy working day, snatched moments to compose poems and plays. She could have been one of the most important writers of the 18th century, but her life was cut tragically short and she died at the age of just 24. Mary Leeper's one of a group of poets who come to increasing prominence in the 18th century. Writers from labouring class backgrounds who lack much formal education and who combine their writing with more prosaic demands of working life. There were agricultural labourers like Stephen Duck, bricklayers like Henry Jones, washerwomen like Mary Collier, milkwomen like Anne Yearsley, and kitchen maids like Mary Leeper. Mary Leeper was born in 1722 and she grew up in the town of Brackley in Northamptonshire where her father was a gardener. She probably attended a local school, and once she had learned to, uh, to read, she devoured everything that she could get her hands on. She began writing verse at the precociously young age of 10 or 11, and from uh, but this at first amused her parents, uh, her mother in particular. But over time, her parents began to worry that verse was becoming too much of a distraction and was taking her away from more profitable employments. At some point, it's not quite clear when, Leeper left home to go and work as a kitchen maid. While she was working at a house called Western Hall, her poetic inclinations came to the attentions of her employer, Susanna Jennings. This was an important moment for Leeper, and Jennings became the first of two very important patron, uh, mentors to the young poet. Jennings encouraged Leeper to write and gave her access to the library at Western Hall and in doing so helped the young poet grow in confidence. The poetical kitchenmaid didn't always meet with such encouragement from her employers however. In her next job, working for the Chauncey family at Edgecote House, um, it was noted that her desire to write verses sometimes took her, away, took her attention away from her duties. One story recorded, her fondness, recorded that her fondness for writing verses displayed itself uh, by her sometimes taking up her pen while the jack was standing still and the meat scorching. So rather than turning the meat she's, be, she's being paid for, she's turning over verse in her head, neglecting her duties. After several years of playing a trade as a kitchen maid, Leeper returned home to Brackley. Her mother had died some years before, and so Leeper's new occupation was to look after her father's house and help out with his business. And it was at this point that she met the second of her two important mentors. This was a woman named Bridget Fremantle, the daughter of a local clergyman. Leeper's writing had acquired her some local notoriety by this point. Uh, Fremantle had heard of this and decided to make the young poet's acquaintance. This was really important for Leeper. She'd gone back to live uh, and work in her father's house, but her father, by his own admission, had no taste for poetry. He had stopped trying to completely dissuade her from writing poetry, but he wasn't the most receptive of audiences. And from the hints that she gives in her writing, her other local readers weren't, I, weren't always receptive um, or sympathetic or stimulating audiences either. So in Bridget Fremantle, 
Lipa found the very audience, the outlet that she required. And for the next year or so, Lipa and Fremantle saw each other every, uh, two or three times a week. Lipa addressed a significant quantity of, quantity of verse to her, um, and, and in these verses she ranged across poetry, fame, religion, and the place of women within contemporary society. And she also created a vivid comic portrait in these poems of the world in which she was living. One of her poems to Fremantle is called Crumble Hall. And it is this poem which has attracted the most attention from modern critics. It's a country house poem um, with a twist. Country house poems are usually celebrations of a particular uh, grand house and the landscape in which it lives, it sits, and the noble, noble owner who commands over it. Leaper's twist on this in Crumble Hall is to offer a view of this great house and the landscape and its inhabitants, all from a servant's perspective. What her portrait of the great house reveals is not the magnificent patron who commands over it, but the servants who are central to its functioning. Crumble Hall is based on Edgecote House, where you, uh, Leeper used to work. It's a house with a great history, and in her poem, Leeper sketches some of that in. She refers to its hospitable door, which has fed the strangers and relieved the poor. Its gothic towers and its rusty spires were known of old to knights and hungry squires, she says. But the illustrious past of Crumble Hall is not really what Leeper's interested in. What she wants to show is what's going on behind the scenes, so that rather than, depress, than, than dwelling on the impressive Grand Hall, for example, she points to the cobwebs high up in the corners of its ceiling that the servants can't reach when they're doing their cleaning. She skips over the ornate tapestries that hang on the wall, and instead she lingers in the dark passages where the mice run, the attics filled with junk, old shoes, bits of broken plough, and stacks of wool filled with cheek ticks. And what of the noble inhabitants of this house? Well, we see fleetingly one of the noble inhabitants asleep, asleep in the library. And there's a critical account of another's plans for renovating the house and gardens. But the real life in this house is in the kitchen. And Leeper's poem stays in the kitchen longer than it does anywhere else. Here, among several characters, we meet Ursula and Roger. Roger, overstuffed with beef, with cabbage much too full, and dumpling too, the emblem of his skull, with mouth wide open but with closing eyes. He's lying on the, on the kitchen table, fast asleep. While he snores contentedly, Ursula looks at him, and with dejected eyes, Ah, Roger, ah, the mournful maiden cries. Is wretched Ursula then, no more your, then your care no more, that while I sigh, thus you can sleep and snore? Ingrateful Roger, wilt thou leave me now? For you, these furrows mark my fading brow. For you, my pigs resign their morning dew. My hungry chickens lose their meat for you. And was it not, ah, was it not for thee, no goodly pottage will be dressed by me. For thee, these hands wind up the whirling jack, or place the spit across the sloping rack. I baste the mutton with a cheerful heart, because I know my Roger will have parts. Here we see one of Leeper's talents, creating vivid characters and dramatic, comic, tragic scenes. One of the biggest processes in the great house is the feeding of all its inhabitants, but here in Leeper's hands it becomes a tiny domestic drama. Ursula isn't motivated by respect for her employers or any thoughts of financial reward. No, she says, she's doing it all for Roger. Knowing that he'll have a part in what she cooks makes it all worthwhile, it makes it bearable. It's delusional and self-aggrandising, but it's also very human and tragic. All her love and devotion directed towards unwieldy Roger, who's snoring his heart out obliviously. Crumble Hall draws on and dramatises Leeper's experiences as a maid, but elsewhere in her writing, she's adamant that her social status should not become the most important thing about her. Fifteen years earlier, um, a poet called Stephen Duck, an agricultural labourer turned poet, 
had become very, very famous. And though he left his labouring background far behind him, he found it enormously hard to shed the label of labourer poet. Leeper didn't want the same uh, label to be attached ineradicably to her own writing. And when it was put to her that foregrounding her biography uh, might make her poetry more saleable, she objected. She wanted her work to stand or fail on its own literary merits. And together with Fremantle, she set about planning the publication of her work. They talked about sending her poems to magazines and newspapers and explored the possibility of publishing a volume of her work and getting her play staged. Within a few years, Leeper, um, or the recognition that Leeper had dreamed of came her way. When her poems were published, they attracted the attention of major literary figures of the day, such as the novelist Samuel Richardson and the poets John Dun Duncan, Isaac Hawkins Brown and Christopher Smart. Her work was included in an important anthology called Poems by Eminent Ladies, um, a collection that celebrated women's writing. And her inclusion in there signalled that she was being identified as one of the leading female poets of the age. But sadly, Leeper did not live to receive these accolades. Indeed, she did not live to see any of her works in print. She died at the age of 24 in November 1746 after contracting measles. With her, tal with her death, a great talent was brought to a premature end. If she had lived, there is no doubt that she would have gone on writing. What would she have written? Would she have written more plays? What kind of success would she have had? And how would she have responded to it? Would she have stayed in Brackley or moved to London in pursuit of a literary career? These are unanswerable questions, of course, but rather than mourning what she didn't have the chance to write, we are fortunate, fortunate enough to have a compelling body of work produced over the course of her short life. A uh, hundred or so poems, one complete play and fragments of two others. And I do encourage you to go and investigate the work of Mary Leeper, who was a young poet of great promise, one of the most witty, original, and to my mind, truly inspirational writers of the 18th century. <laughs>